Good afternoon. afternoon. Welcome back. I'm Suzanne Spaulding. I have the honor of being a member of the Aspen Institute Homeland Security Group and the great privilege of introducing this afternoon's panel. Uh, And I'm here really for two reasons. One is that uh, the great team at the Aspen Institute asked me to be here, and I always accede to their requests. Uh, And the second is that uh, I I wanted to take this brief opportunity to challenge the title of this panel, uh, which is Security Versus Liberty. And that construct, like the balancing of national security and civil liberties, uh, I think runs the risk of creating the impression that these are two mutually exclusive values on opposite sides of a scale and that if you take away from one, you add to the other and vice versa. When in fact, I think they are more often than not mutually reinforcing values. We understand we can't have liberty without security, but it is also the case that our liberties and the protection of of those liberties is a tremendous and important source of our country's strength. And we see it in Mike Rogers' comment this morning Uh, where he said, the most important thing to me is that we engender the confidence and trust of the people we defend. He understands that his organization and the country are weaker if they don't maintain that public trust and confidence. We've seen it in community policing and CVE efforts, but we see it most concretely in the areas that will be discussed today where so often we are, not, we are making trade-offs within the national security space. It's not that you never have to make trade-offs within, among things that fall under civil liberties and things that fall under the rubric of national security, but it's important to understand that very often you're making trade-offs within that security space and it's sometimes captured as security versus security. And we have a tremendous panel today Uh, that's going to help illuminate those issues and some of the challenges in getting this right. You will notice that we do not have Richard Benveniste here today. Uh, He, unfortunately, at the very last minute, was called away. And uh, much to our uh, great good fortune, uh, we have a pinch hitter (laughs) who really could have subbed on any one of the panels in the last three days. but to our good fortune, is subbing on this panel. Uh, And it's not only uh, great that he could be here on this panel, but appropriate that he is here for one of the last panels as the security forum uh, draws to a close. Uh, Because this is Walter Isaacson's last uh, uh, conference uh, as the uh, president and CEO uh, of the Aspen Institute. Thank you, Suzanne. Appreciate it. And we wanted to just take a second to acknowledge his uh, amazing tenure in the 13 years that he's been here at the Aspen Institute, bringing those skills honed as a journalist and in media uh, to this forum and understanding the importance of uh, bringing people together, having a public bipartisan discussion to enhance understanding uh, and create a more secure, vibrant, Uh, and and robust world that we all live in. And he leaves behind an amazing legacy from Aspen Ideas uh, to this security forum, uh, to the youth uh, leadership training and and work that that he has instituted. Uh, And uh, and so I think it's very appropriate, Walter, that you are here uh, at this panel, and we are so grateful for all that you have done. Thank you. So I'm going to turn the panel over to our very able moderator, Ellen Nakashima, who is uh, an award-winning journalist with the Washington Post who covers uh, national security issues. And she was part of a team that won the Pulitzer Prize for Public Service for important reporting on the very kinds of issues that will be discussed today. Ellen? Thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Suzanne, for your remarks. And thank you to the Aspen Institute for hosting this panel and for inviting me to be here today. This is my first time at uh, the Aspen Aspen Institute uh, Security Forum. And it's been just a fantastic three days of uh, of sessions. I am thrilled and honored to have Walter 
on our panel. Not only could he have subbed in on any panel, he could be moderating this panel. So be far easier than having to answer <laughs> I'll questions. Pass it over to you. So, so I'm I'm thrilled to have you here today. And uh, we have a very distinguished uh, panel of, of of speakers. Next to me is Dana Bente, who is a more than 30 year veteran of the Department of Justice. Uh, it's been a quiet week there, hasn't it, Dana? <laughs> and uh, he is currently dual-hatted as the uh, U.S. Attorney for the Eastern District of Virginia and the Acting Assistant Attorney General for the National Security Division. Um, and you were also, for about a week and a half in January, the Acting As Attorney General when President Trump fired Sally Yates uh, over her, uh, the travel ban issue, and then for about a month and a half, you were acting deputy attorney general. About, actually, about three months. Was it, sorry, three months <laughs> acting deputy attorney general when uh, Jeff Sessions was confirmed. So as uh, now we understand why Loretta, Loretta Lynch once called you the consummate utility player. <laughs> uh, and next to Dana is Monica Bickert, who is the head of counterterrorism and product policy for Facebook, which is the world's largest online platform with almost 2 billion users, also a former federal prosecutor who worked in Washington, D.C. and Chicago going after everything from uh, public corruption to gang violence. So as Suzanne said, so often uh, the debate is framed in terms of uh, privacy versus security. And I must admit, when I first got invited to moderate this panel, I saw the title. I said, well, you know, that's kind of trite, maybe it's not always just privacy versus security, but having never done this before, I didn't think I could come in and, and, and change the title. But in any case, um, as the first, uh, as Robert Hannigan and, um, and Mike Rogers talk, spoke about in their panel, I think we are starting to move to a point where we can talk about just identifying what the trade-offs are and, and how do we lessen the impact of those trade-offs in terms of what measure of privacy, what measure of security, what measure of freedom of speech we are going to, how do we lessen the impacts of those? And we're gonna to get to that today in this panel, but first, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, ask you, Dana, in light of uh, current remarks from, from the president this week, uh, to comment on something he said in his interview to the New York Times, where he, he basically attacked the attorney general, uh, saying that the attorney general should not have recused himself from the Russia investigation. And he then also attacked the deputy attorney general uh, for having um, appointed Bob Mueller as special counsel to head the probe. So this was an attack by the president on the rule of law, and it raises concerns about the independence of criminal investigations at the Department of Justice. Dana, how confident are you that the department can maintain its independence from such political pressures, including from the White House? Well, and how do you ensure that it's done? Yeah. Ellen, well, initially, there's um, you know, communications with the White House under every uh, administration are very limited. There's only a certain number of people who can talk to the White House. So all of those come through the attorney general, the associate attorney general, or the deputy attorney general. Uh, and so there really aren't communications with the people who as I like to say, actually do the work. Uh, the attorneys uh, who are the career employees, and I guess it's in a way that's a little bit different, but to answer your question, you know, people will frequently ask me how the morale is in the department, or even in my office where I've been for 17 years in Virginia, and I normally say, well, you know, when you're the U.S. attorney, they don't come up and tell you it sucks around here. Uh, you know, <laughs> let's do something about it. So you may be the worst person to ask, but, but I'll rely upon my 33 years in the department. And much like uh, Mr. Brennan, I've served under six different presidents uh, since I started in 1984. Uh, I have every confidence in the career employees to follow the rule of law, to do what's right. They're... Uh, a marvelous group of people. They're completely dedicated to our mission, which we'll get into a little bit later, but the department's basic mission is to protect public safety. I think we probably could all agree that's the core function of government at its most basic level, as I think Justice Powell once wrote. And so uh, for those people who do all of the real heavy lifting, the real work, uh, I am absolutely confident in their ability to uh, continue to do what's right for the American people and 
follow the rule of law. Thank you, thank you. Um, and, and so do you feel that the effects, uh, that the statements that the president has made have actually had an effect on your workforce and do you ever feel a need to reassure them? Uh, I, I have not felt that need uh, at mm -hmm. this time. I did, you know, when I came in, it was a little bit of a, uh, a crisis uh, after the, uh, the executive order, but I think it was more uh, to assure the people who were enforcing the president's uh, executive order and then the second order that uh, what they were doing was the right thing. Uh, and surprisingly, uh, after I took over, uh, it was interesting. Uh, I got several emails from uh, people who were working on the immigration order who thanked me for allowing them to do their job mm -hmm. uh, because they were interested in defending the president's orders. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Walter, be before we launch in, I also wanted to ask you t uh, a question based on Suzanne said that Admiral Rogers mentioned that most important to me is we engender the confidence and trust of the people we defend. Mm -hmm. Walter, how can the government engender confidence and trust in the people when the president himself is making such statements, attacking his attorney general, attacking the credibility of the intelligence? Well, I think you just heard Dana yeah. say that career people and people who are sworn to, and everybody, mm -hmm. I think in government, is either career or sworn to do an oath that the, what they're gonna do. Uh, most of them will act that way. I'm very confident in our government. I think I had Mo Rogers back there, right? And there you are, sir. Um, and I have no fear that the, having been out to Fort Meade, that the people in the NSA and the people in the FBI and the people in uh, the Justice Department are going to do their duty to this country. You know, we have a really great country. I, I don't mind the president speaking out everything else. We just have to yeah. be resilient enough. When the president says something, people say fine. I think there will be certain lines that could be crossed. And um, since it's a competitor of yours, we can say Twitter, you know, that's not one of those lines. I think if he fired Mueller, you would have a constitutional crisis. I think it would finally, uh, you know, I mean, I just know so many Republicans on the Hill who respect him deeply, and that would be distorting what government does, but tweeting about things, hey, you know, this is a free country, and it's kind of all part of uh, the discourse, and resisting those pressures is something I'm sure that the people who work with the U.S. government are capable of doing. Okay, great, thank you. So let's move to the the debate about uh, security or uh, pr liberty versus security. More in recent years, especially when it comes to the debate over encryption, which we talked about a little while ago this morning, we started to hear people reframe it from privacy versus security to security versus security. Or in other words, uh, cybersecurity and the ability to thwart, say, a hacker uh, versus national security and the ability to detect, detect and thwart a terrorist. So the technologist Bruce Schneier argues, and I quote, data security is essential for all national security in the 21st century, whereas being able to eavesdrop on communications is a possibly useful, nice to have investigative tool. Do you agree with his argument, Monica, and his reframing of the debate? Well, I think you know the the issue really is mm -hmm. how do we best keep people safe, and that does take different forms. It does mean keeping people safe from their data being hacked and shared, their identity being stolen. Mm -hmm. It also means keeping people safe from uh, threats of violence online and making sure that if somebody's say planning a terror attack, that we're best positioned to to uh, try to find that and try to get it to the appropriate authorities. So. Um, in a sense, yes, it, it is a security versus security kind of argument. Um, I, I wouldn't necessarily frame it in exactly the same way. I, do, I, I spent more than 10 years as a prosecutor, mm -hmm. and I had cases where, uh, you know, child safety cases, child pornography cases, where we could not access content, and the content might have been very relevant to our case. So I, I, 
I don't think it's as easy as saying that this never matters, that content right. never matters, but at the same time, I think we have to be mindful of the fact that you cannot create an access point, uh, vulnerability in encryption for the purpose, for the good purpose of responding to valid legal process with content without also weakening a system so that bad actors, malicious actors can exploit that vulnerability. Um, so, you know, that's, that's something that is fundamental to the encryption debate that I think we have to be aware of. Well, maybe we should back up for a minute here and sort of just lay the terms for the encryption debate and talk a little bit about what, uh, what, what, what uh, types of encryption there are because we have data at rest on devices, on your iPhone, your, your pictures, your text messages that are stored there, which was, was a type of data that the uh, FBI could not get into with the hacker and uh, the terrorist in San Bernardino. And then you have data in motion, which are communications, phone calls, text messages that are being sent through the air, which sometimes are called end-to-end -end encrypted, which law enforcement, if it's end-to-end -end encrypted, cannot get access to once it's in motion. And the companies cannot either. And the companies cannot either because they don't have, uh, they don't have the key. The only people who have it are the sender and the receiver. So you have those two different types of encryption, two different types of, of problems and solutions all get lumped in together as this one big going dark. Um, but I guess I wanted to also ask Dana to sort of describe uh, the extent of the problem and its impact on investigations both in national security cases and in the criminal side, because I think they might be a little different too. Uh, a little different, but it's somewhat mm -hmm. hard to separate sometimes. Mm -hmm. We can kind of go through that a little bit. I, I would, I, I don't know Mr. Schneider, but I also don't know if he's ever tried any criminal cases. So I'm not sure that I would agree that it's just kind of something nice to have like a new set of golf clubs. Uh, it's, cool. it's really, there, there are cases, look, if you're going to have, an, there's a need for strong encryption. Nobody argues about that. There's mm -hmm. a need for personal privacy. Nobody's going to argue uh, against that. It just is a matter of how absolute it's going to be. I mean, I don't think it's ever been absolute. The, it's always been a reasonable expectation of uh, privacy, at least constitutionally. Uh, so, but if you're going to have encryption platforms that no one can get into, uh, there is going to be a cost to that. And I'm, I'm not the sky is falling or something like that, but there'll be certain cases that you cannot prosecute. Uh, in some cases, you'll be able to. We try to work around it. We don't like, okay, pick up our toys and go home. If a cell phone is encrypted, we continue to work. But, but there will be a certain number of cases that cannot be tried. In society, that's a decision it will make. Uh, whether you know, you're going to have that absolute block of information of conversations that are, uh, we can't use. Uh, we, we want, you know, there's a lot of protections when we go to get a, a conversation. It's not that we just are out there you know, randomly trolling. We've, we're looking at, at criminals, we think, and we have to, uh, in the case of a search warrant, where the content of uh, communications, the content of, we have to, have probable cause. It's even different uh, when we, I mean, by a detached magistrate. We don't get to decide that. And mm -hmm. the same thing with um, our Title III warrants. You know, they're reviewed periodically by a judge to make sure everything's going yeah. okay. But but I think that uh, to say there's going to be no cost at all would would be wrong. And to say that we ought to have access to it, I and it, there's always this description of. The government wants a back door. Well, no, I don't want a back door that I can just access. Uh, I, I have tremendous confidence in our technology industry. It's by far the best in the world. We invented most everything there is with it. Yeah. To say that we can't have a system where that is secure and that with appropriate judicial oversight, those are provided to the government in a criminal investigation, I just don't accept that narrative. Okay. Well, let me just throw out some numbers. About a year ago, I think the FBI said that they, the, um, the thousands of phones they had uh, collected in criminal cases, they couldn't get into, uh, was it 30% 30, 30 of them or so? so? Now, from October through July, they've gotten 10,000 phones. And now they can't get into about a little over 5,000, so 51% of them. So the percentage of phones that they can't break uh, because of the strong encryption has gone up. Now, Dana, have you started to collect 
uh, statistics on the number of cases that you can't make because of, say, these sorts of yeah. strong encryption? No, not, not precise numbers, because they say we, we continue to do our best to, to work around that. In some cases, you can. In some cases, you can't. Uh, your concern uh, as a prosecutor, I guess, is, is kind of twofold. One is it's not just national security cases. I, I wasn't here to see Secretary Kelly speak, but uh, I'd be surprised if he didn't talk about uh, fentanyl. Uh, and the problems we're having that we're going to lose 50,000 people this year in this country. So that's kind of a national security concern, even though we do it on our narcotics units. But, but there are cases that, that they're using that are encrypted that we don't have access to the uh, communications. The other concern is, look, we were very lucky in San Bernardino, lucky being relative. 14 people were killed. It was a great tragedy. But it wasn't an active, ongoing uh, conspiracy threat for another attack, for instance, like they had in Paris, where it might have been imperative to get access quickly. Uh, through the luxury of time, the FBI was able to uh, break through. Uh, and so that's, you know. It took a few weeks, what, and a six-figure sum to, yeah. to get that. Yeah. What if you had had a, a Paris-like case and there was an ongoing uh, terrorist threat? Uh, what do you think? the government would have done or should have done. And also, uh, Walter, you know, please give me your thoughts on well, that. Well, they would do everything they could. But even in a mm -hmm. case where you know, I don't know the particulars of the encryption mm -hmm. in San Bernardino, but let's say you're able to acquire from a third party a program, it, it still takes a long time for them to get into that phone. So it's not that you're going to be able to do it immediately. I don't know how long the actual activities it took to break the encryption on that phone, but it, it wasn't, OK, here's the code, and it's done. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it took a long time, uh, I suspect. I think it would be useful to go back to the basic principles, because if we all could agree on the basic principles, I'm sure the technologies could be working around it, and to stick to the case of, a, say, a phone that's encrypted in a San Bernardino or everything else, uh, as you said, and, uh, we don't have absolute uh, anonymity in our society. You know, Ben Franklin was the first to phrase the title of this panel, because three times in his writings he talks about those who would trade off too much of their uh, privacy in order to get security deserve neither. It was a phrase he kind of liked. He kept playing with it. But he was somebody who fully understood, uh, as you met, did the Constitution and then uh, the Bill of Rights so after his time, that you had to put in the notion of an unreasonable search and seizure. Nothing is absolute like that. So you have to say, well, how are we going to allow legitimate searches of data or of information that are done for valid reasons? So it's been 250 years. We work our way through it. But we say, OK, a court has the issue an order, a writ. Right. And by the way, we should all try to comply with that. So it would seem to me, and I go against Apple and others on this, that at least you should say, I'm willing to be within the reach of a laws that have been created over 250 years that allow a court-ordered writ to allow searches of information in important cases and allow me to resist that when I feel it's been done unreasonably, but at least we're all going to obey by the principle of the law. And Ellen, can I, can I uh, jump in with just two things? You know, first, I just want to be clear that these, when we're talking about end-to-end -end encryption, as Ellen pointed out, there's a bunch of different types of encryption. And a service like Facebook doesn't use end-to-end -end encryption. It uses client-to-server, server-to-client encryption. So with Facebook, we can and do provide content in response to, say, an FBI search warrant. Now, you look at mobile messaging apps, and that's different. That's where end-to-end -end encryption is the easiest to implement. It's pretty hard to do it through a web browser. It's easier on a mobile device. It's also pretty much the standard internationally. Now, those companies can, and at least in the ca case of WhatsApp, um, do respond to legal process with what they have. Facebook owns WhatsApp. Mm -hmm. Yes, they, they can respond with what they have. And that would be metadata, and that might include uh, information like uh, subscriber information, logs, location information, things that could be very relevant to authorities. They cannot see the content. Even if they really, really want to, and it's a big deal case, they cannot get that content. 
So when you think about creating systems that would, uh, would weaken that, where you say, okay, we're gonna build in a way for us to respond with content to law enforcement requests, you have to think also about what the really bad actors are likely to do and who is really gonna be harmed by that vulnerability. Encryption, device level encryption, like we're talking about with Apple, that's just not that hard to do. When I was a prosecutor, I saw defendants who were not particularly savvy encrypting their devices with things like PGP and things that we couldn't break, but th things that were free and available readily. So uh, when, you, when you weaken end-to-end -end encryption for these mobile messenger apps, you may well be doing nothing really to get the content from the really bad actors because they're gonna have device level encryption, but you may be making it easier uh, for those malicious actors out there to hurt people who are engaged in whether it's banking transactions, buying things online, talking about healthcare, the things that all of us really want to right. be protected. But Monica, I think it was one of the, uh, it was the terrorist who attacked the Westminster Bridge in London recently who had WhatsApp, and I believe the authorities wanted to see what he was, he sent some text messages on WhatsApp before his attack, but they couldn't gain access to those messages because WhatsApp was end-to-end -end encrypted. So they do use, you know, these messaging apps that are end-to-end -end encrypted. And I guess you, you talked about how you just, not you, but companies who build these apps just can't get the data when they're end-to-end -end encrypted. But, they, but these companies built them that way. And did they build them knowing, I mean, realizing, in fact, Apple advertised its, in one of its uh, new encryption uh, uh, devices as warrant proof. So do you, do, do you build them knowing that you, law enforcement won't get away, or, or is there any thought to maybe what law enforcement's needs might be? Can you build these in a way that can accommodate somehow? And, and I, I will note that WhatsApp was cooperative with authorities and did respond mm -hmm. to legal process with the information that, that they could provide. Um, I can't speak to why companies necessarily build apps, mm -hmm. but I can tell you that when I walk around with this phone, um, I am not worried about the FBI getting a search warrant for the contents of my messages. I don't think it's likely, and I really wouldn't care. I, I do worry about malicious actors who might gain access to my financial information, my private communications. So that's a legitimate concern and one that I, I think companies are mindful of as they, mm -hmm. as they create these types of technologies. Okay. Uh, in the I keep going back to the panel with uh, Hannigan and, and Rogers because they covered so much of the, the ground that we are in, in sense of setting the table, which is great. And they talked about the, how the relationship between the tech companies and the government has evolved, has improved uh, in, in the years since Snowden. Initial, after the initial leaks, I think Hannigan said that Snowden poisoned the relationship. But today, Rogers said, you know, we're, we have dialogue. So if, if that's the case, has the dialogue meant that you are coming to you know, an accommodation or a compromise of sorts, Dana and Monica? Well, to, to, uh, <clears throat> to step back just a little bit yeah. to the encryption, uh, the, you know, the terrorism uh, challenge in, challenges in Europe are, are really uh, kind of tough, and, and they may you know, lead the way and carry some of our water on this. I know Germany has already proposed legislation uh, that might require uh, companies to, to build in something so they could respond to legal right. process. And I, I think there was someone else, so we'll have to see how that goes. I mean, if enough countries do that, I'm sure we'll find some technological brilliance that will uh, provide the uh, necessary security, but still allow a government to do it. To, redirect to your question. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we have you know, a, a very good relationship with the social media companies and, uh, and IT, and it's, it's gotten better. Does that mean we aren't going to have some disagreements on occasion? Of course not. Uh, it's, like, it's like any family. Uh, you, have, you have some disagreements. But, it, but we're, we're working with them on a lot of different areas. Let's not yeah. mistake about that. Particularly in the going dark encryption area, though, yeah. where, what concrete steps have you all made in, in industry and government to come closer, to come to some kind of accommodation? Uh, well, that is an, an area where I think we, we do have significant differences. Monica? I, you know, I, I would say that one thing we've tried to do is make sure that we are making it, uh, making the process for requesting available data 
faster and more efficient. And part of this is making sure that the companies just have the appropriate mechanisms to respond when they get a request from, say, an FBI search warrant. Part of it is also law reform. Right now, if there is a, a, an attack over in Germany and German authorities want to get access to content on a Facebook or a Twitter, they have to go through the mutual legal assistance treaty process, which is pretty time consuming, pretty yeah. difficult. There are some, there are some times where situations might be different. There might be some sort of proactive referral from the companies, but uh, you know, I've, felt, I've dealt with those, those systems as a prosecutor. They're, pr they're pretty tough. So we are working together. There is a dialogue going about how we streamline those systems and uh, make it work better. And I think that's a really good thing, and I do think Facebook, having talked to Marnie and having talked to Cheryl and others, have been leading the way to make a more constructive dialogue. Because as you say, whether it's end-to-end -end encryption or other things, uh, it's a technological challenge. If you're going to allow a, uh, a messaging service to respond to legal warrants, it's going to open it up to illegal actions as well. And the goal should be not to say you just can't do it to have that fight, but to say, okay, here's what we can actually say we would like to try to do, which is stop bad actors, and, uh, but also allow the type of privacy you would get where you're not gonna be hacked in by hackers, uh, and turn our attention to that goal, because the engineers, whether it's at the engineers who invented WhatsApp, which I think when did you all acquire it? Uh, a couple of years ago. A couple of years ago. Or anything else, they could have turned their mind to making it compliant, or they could turn their minds to try to resist government, and it's better to have the dialogue mm -hmm. to right. say, how can we work this out to a mutual benefit? Right, I think I've, I've heard that when you talk privately to engineers at these companies, they'll tell you, you know, well, you, there is actually, there can be a way, but when you get to the higher up levels where you're talking strategic uh, uh, marketing and business solutions, then, then it's not as, it doesn't seem as perhaps doable. Yes, Dana? I was just gonna say, you know, they, uh, you know businesses owe, you know, some um, loyalty to their stockholders. So if you're talking about, you know, a commercial, what they view as, uh, commercially necessary, I'd say that's understandable. Uh, I, I do think that this is going to be an issue that will continue to grow, as I said, mm -hmm. perhaps being led by the Europeans. And when mm -hmm. you have a, a number of large countries with large market shares that are going to require this, I, I think we'll find a change. Let me just interject when you say the Europeans. It is a real shame that in our political system, and particularly in Washington and our Congress now, we can't have reasonable discussions, say, let's figure out how we're gonna reauthorize 702 right. like we know we need to do, and let's figure out how we're gonna set a, some principles for what is within the reach of the law, what should be totally private or whatever, and you just could maybe just fantasize about the day in which Democrats and Republicans of good faith on various <laughs> committees could work together and say, okay, we're gonna set some policies here. But at the moment, Congress cannot set policies for us because they've become poisoned and partisan. So divided. But, but I, I think we're all hopeful that we'll see uh, a great deal of work done on 702 and that mm -hmm. they'll come together uh, on that. Section 702, yeah. right. Uh, we could go on and on on this topic, but I, you know, in the interest of time, I think I'll move on to another uh, big issue involving uh, technology and security, which is the terrorism uh, presence online. And Monica, this is an area in which you're an expert. Um, can, you, can you talk to us, Monica, about how you at Facebook define terrorist content? How do you tell the difference between an ISIS battlefield video, let's say, and something put up by Al Jazeera or another journalist? Uh, and, and when you find something, what do you do with it? And what is your threshold for taking things down? I, I can share with you our policies, which as difficult as it sometimes is to draw that line, it's actually way easier than actually finding the stuff, which we can also talk about. Mm -hmm. uh, our policies at Facebook are that we don't allow any violent organization, this would certainly include ISIS, Boko Haram, Al-Qaeda, we don't allow any violent organization to have a presence on the site. We don't allow anybody to represent them. So if somebody puts up a, an ISIS page, 
We don't even know if it really is ISIS or not. We would take it down. And we also don't allow any content that supports or praises these groups, their people, or their actions. So if there is, in the wake of an attack, somebody posting on Facebook saying, that was great, or it's funny these people died, or, or whatever, that would violate our, our policies, and we would remove it. Now, the, the real challenge is, how do you identify that on a site that, as Ellen said, has 2 billion people using it every day, billions of posts and photos every day? And the answer is two things. One is you try to empower your community to tell you. And we do that through having in-app reporting. If you're using Facebook, you can report any piece of content. When you do, that comes into our teams sitting around the world, and they review it. And these teams speak. They speak dozens of languages. Uh, they review this content, the vast majority of it, within 24 hours. And if they find that something is terrorism-related, violates our terrorism policies, they'll not only remove that, but they'll we'll then look at the entire account and see what's going on here. Is this something that we maybe need to send to our legal team? Maybe this is something that needs to be sent to law enforcement. So there's that process. The other way we identify it is by proactively going after it. And we can do that through using technology that does things like um, measure, well, looking for when somebody posts a known video or image of terror propaganda. You mentioned how do you tell the difference between if a reporter posts something or uh, if a terrorist posts it. So let's just take an image of the ISIS flag. That could be shared by a terrorist or somebody who's promoting ISIS. It could also be shared by a journalist who's writing an article about ISIS. We would not allow the former. We would allow the latter. We can use technology to find that. Hmm. If somebody uploads that photo, we'll recognize it before it is uploaded. We can then send it to our reviewers, who will look at it and say, who's sharing this? Is this a journalist? Are they condemning this group, or are they actually part of this group or, or promoting this group? And that's how we make that determination. I would say that in the past year, we've seen a lot of advances in that, that proactive use of technology. And it's, it's recognizing known images and videos. Mm -hmm. It's starting to develop predictive technologies that will, even if it's not exactly the same picture of the ISIS flag, that will recognize that this is a photo or a video that, that uh, has something that we should be looking at. And it's also the use of uh, technology that allows us to uh, look at natural language. Now, it's complicated because you've got a whole lot of different languages. And I'm no engineer, but one of the things I've learned from the engineers is that in order to use machine learning, you really have to have a lot of examples at the outset. You can't just say, you know, uh, here, machine, go out magically and find when people are promoting a, a terror group in Turkish. You have to have the data that shows you what that looks like. So to inform that technology, one of the things that we do is work with academics. Uh, and with others in industry. We now have a collaborative effort by the major social media companies to share digital signatures of terrorist videos and photos that allows us, if Twitter finds something, they'll put it in this bank. We can access that bank. We can take that digital signature, put it in our software, and stop a video from, uh, from appearing on our site. So we can, we can do it that way. And also through talking to academics, we learn what are the newest images, what are the newest trends, and that can help us build our technology. Can I say something <laughs> that would just, we should applaud Facebook and the fact that they're going way out of their way to be a good corporate uh, actor on the global stage and to hire you to help do it. I'm, and I'm not kidding. I knew what Facebook was doing, but as you went through all of those things, and the extra steps you're going to, that's the type of thing that I don't think people quite realize. And it really is a service for which we should applaud you. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I, I do want to say we recognize we're not perfect in this space. One of the things that we're doing now is we're formalizing our collaborative efforts with companies. So we now have what we're calling the Global Internet Forum to Counter Terrorism which we're hopeful, we've been working with about 20 social media companies for the past two years informally on best practices to counter terrorism. We're hopeful this is gonna be a more public, more formal effort that will include uh, far more companies. One of the reasons I think people often don't know what we're doing is because we haven't done a lot of talking about it. And that's on us. And there are reasons that we, we historically haven't talked about it. One of them is, uh, and again, looking back to my prosecutorial days, uh, part of it is you don't want to give away the blueprints for what you're doing because that makes it harder. Mm. But we're recognizing 
at least at Facebook, that people really need to know that we care about this, that we take it seriously, and that we're working on, on uh, making these platforms safe. Terrific. Are there any metrics for gauging the impact or effectiveness or success of your efforts? Uh, and if, if you do know of any? Or? Uh, I can share with you that right now, the majority of accounts that we mm -hmm. remove for terrorism are uh, accounts that we identify ourselves. They've not been reported to us. They're accounts that we've used, uh, that we've used technology or, or um, fan outs to find. Fan outs meaning we've identified one account. We then look at the associated accounts and see if we can find uh, bad actions there. Um, I would also say, you asked, what do we do when we find terrorist content? Well, one thing that we do, if, it's, uh, if it looks like this is maybe somebody planning an attack or considering traveling to Syria to, to, to fight, that's the sort of content that we send to our legal team for possible proactive referral to law enforcement. And with that, we, uh, we work with, uh, we're in dialogue with the FBI. Can you talk a little bit about it from the government side, Dana, in terms of your observations of how this, uh, the efforts by social media companies have affected, for better or for worse, the work you do? Sure. Uh, well, it's been repeated a couple of times, I mm -hmm. think, during the forum, what, what I've seen. Uh, this has become, in the last several years, a, a terrific challenge. Uh, ISIS really learned how to use the internet in recruiting and fundraising. Uh, is an, you know, Anwar Alawaki, who's been gone for some time, continues to be uh, a big recruiting tool for them on the internet. Uh, we've worked very closely with the major uh, platforms, such as Facebook. Uh, they've been very good partners, I have to say, on this uh, issue. We're, we're pleased with the relationship. We do it like we do in any other kind of community outreach. Uh, the Bureau takes the lead on it, but you know, if they have something they can flag for them or tell them what kind of trends, the problems that they're seeing. Uh, and I think for the most part, the, the large companies and even the smaller companies, you know, they don't want to be a platform for terror. That's not good for business to mm -hmm. have, you know, that type of kind of vile materials uh, on their system. It is a real challenge for them uh, because of the fact that you, know, you take something down and somebody puts something up. So, but I have to, as we did, I have to applaud their efforts in this area. Uh, we hope to move forward. And uh, next week, I think, uh, they're uh, hosting uh, a forum uh, among many of the IT companies with uh, the Home Secretary, Teresa Rudd, and uh, Secretary Kelly will be out in uh, Northern California. Walter, you think even if we could get rid of the terrorist presence online, do you, how much of an impact do you think that would make on, on actual radicalization um, of, of extremists you know, here in the United States, let's say? Yeah, I, I'm obviously not an expert in that, but it does seem to me that we've entered an age in which we've had two major factors uh, happen. One was the internet and the anonymity that comes sure. with uh, various internet communications. And the second is the rise of non-state actors in the terrorist realm. And those two things together have created a real problem. I obviously think that having technology amplifies the power of a group, whether it be ISIS or for that matter, a domestic terrorist group or trolls or you know, just hate mongers in our country. Uh, you know, when I was growing up, there were always weird people handing out pamphlets that were sort of KKK or, you know, left wing, whatever they may be. But they had to sit there and mimeograph pamphlets and look like an idiot while they stood in front of the state fair. Now, you know, the ability, and I think underlying that is the issue of anonymity. And we've been sometimes conflate or even confuse anonymity with privacy. We all like privacy, but we don't have an absolute right to anonymity, which means you take no responsibility for what you do. Here at the Institute, our basic thing is our, called our executive seminar, mm -hmm. and it starts with Plato and Plato's Republic. And Plato says, if you, has the ring of gauges, and if you put it on, you're anonymous, nobody can see you, you can do whatever you want. Would you have a civil society? And he says, no. And I think what's happened is in this global connection of non-state actors and the internet, we've proven Plato right and that we don't need to enshrine anonymity into every system we build. Mm -hmm. And 
to follow up on what Walter said, who would have thought that we would have seen the absolute explosion in child pornography cases? But I think that is all because of people think they had this anonymity mm -hmm. on the internet and there's really caused, you know, uh, just, you know, 15 years ago, we didn't have anywhere near uh, the commitment of resources we do now to prosecuting uh, child pornography. You just didn't even think about it. Mm -hmm. uh, Monica, you, you mentioned uh, a little bit about Germany, I think. Were you the one who mentioned? Oh, Dana did. Germany. It. Well, Germany is passing. Well, there, there are different countries in Europe responding to whether it's terrorist attacks or what they feel are threats um, you know, to their civil society. They are starting to, to, to pass more stringent laws that regulate what tech companies can do within their borders. How do you as a global company deal with this patchwork of laws uh, that requires you to do one thing in the United States, another thing in the UK, another thing in Germany, whether it's in the encryption area, terrorism online, and then you know uh, hate speech or fake news, which we will get to next. How do you navigate that? What, what do you do? The, those laws affect us in significant ways. On, on Facebook, more than 85% of people are based outside the United States. 85, more than 85% of the 2 million people on Facebook are outside the US. And across Facebook services, uh, including WhatsApp and Instagram, it's uh, more than 80%. So when we have potential laws in Germany, France, South Africa, India, these laws really do affect our service. One of the things that we see is laws to remove speech. And that might be, in fact, this is sort of top of mind for me because we've been, we've been dealing with the German government on this. Uh, German laws around hate speech. We don't allow hate speech on Facebook, but our definition of hate speech is not the same as the German legal definition. Their definition is broader, and it has a little more flexibility and sub subjectivity than you can reasonably build into an, an operational system like we have uh, so on a social So for instance, you, they don't allow not, Nazi propaganda or any... Uh, we wouldn't allow that either. Here. But, okay. um, but we allow... Our hate speech policy is that we don't allow attacks against a person or a group of people based on a protected characteristic like race, religion, sexual orientation, and so forth. We do allow people to criticize religions, governments, and other institutions. So you could see somebody on Facebook criticizing, let's move away from Germany and, and uh, maybe go to Turkey. You could see people criticizing a religion in Turkey. That would be OK under our policies. It would not necessarily be OK under Turkish law. We sometimes get requests from governments saying, this may not violate your terms, but it violates our law. And in those cases, depending on the legal process that's submitted to us, we may end up blocking that speech in that country only, which is sort of weird if you think about it. If you use Facebook like, like I do, if you've got friends all over the world, then the continuity of the experience really depends on seeing the same stuff and being able to comment on, on it and share it. That experience is somewhat broken when your friend in Turkey cannot see what you are commenting on. Uh, but that's a reality of How does it work in China world. with you? We're not in China. Hmm. Uh, yeah, so we, we that don't. That was a conscious decision that all of your apps, including WhatsApp and Instagram, not in China? Facebook is not in China. Okay. Um, but, uh, and that's, the Chinese government actually blocks services. But WhatsApp uh, is, right? WhatsApp is in China. So uh, to, to play off that, what if China passed a law requiring WhatsApp or other apps to have a, a, a mechanism to allow for law enforcement to get access to the data in the clear? Would, would you comply? Would you re-engineer the app so that it, ha it can do that? Or would you just pull out and say, forget you? It's, it's hard to look into the future and guess like that. And I certainly wouldn't be <laughs> the person who would be uh, making that decision in a vacuum. But I think uh, one of the reasons that we do talk to governments around the world is exactly to raise the point I raised earlier, which is it might look, it might look like a simple solution to say, we as a government need access to data or we as a government want you to pull down this speech that violates our hate speech law, um, or we as a government want you to report terrorist content. We could talk about that, but uh, want you to report every piece of terrorist content to law enforcement authorities. Those are the sorts of conversations we have with government so we can say, if you legislate, here's what you can expect to happen in terms of unintended consequences around the world. And Tell it's just not that, not that the legislation is never the right answer, but just to make sure that legislation is thoughtful. You're referring to a proposal by Senator Feinstein from a few years ago that never went anywhere, but her idea was to require companies like Facebook to 
proactively report any time to look for, right? A yes. Actual it, terrorist it, content. The legislation. And report uh, it. The legislation d required companies to report, this wasn't defined, I don't think the legislation really got that far, but it was to report terrorism content to law enforcement authorities whenever you become aware of it. Sounds pretty good. But when you, when you really think about what that is, uh, getting companies to report terrorist content to law enforcement authorities, as Dana said, is not the problem. Companies don't want this stuff on their services. If you are a social media company and you see somebody planning an attack, you're going to call law enforcement. The problem is not, once you become aware of it, do you report it? The problem is, do you go looking for it? And a couple years ago, I think uh, for many social media companies, the answer was no. And it wasn't that they wanted the content on their platform. It was more of a lack of capacity or a lack of recognition of the problem. Now I think companies around the industry are recognizing this as an issue. They're starting to invest resources in looking for this content. The reason that the legislation uh, made me nervous was because if you're telling companies every time you find a beheading video, you need to report it to the FBI, you're opening those companies up to potential civil liability. And if you do that, they're not going to go looking for it. They have a disincentive to actually go looking for this terrorist content. So although it's counterintuitive, uh, legislation like that I actually I think could hurt our efforts to get industry to go proactively looking for terrorist content. Okay. Uh, we're running out of time, so I wanted to get in a couple of questions on the fake news issue, then we can open it up to the audience. Uh, not to pick on you, Monica, but yeah, you're <laughs> our, our social media representative here in Facebook. On the issue of fake news, uh, first of all, Facebook, we understand, is partnering now with fact-checking organizations to be able to flag uh, possible fake news or hoax stories as disputed. Talk to us a little bit about what you're doing and why, and how do you define fake news, you know, as opposed to what the president calls fake news? What is yes. fake news to you? I, and that's a fundamental question. How do you define right. fake news? Because I get this question all the time from people, and when I ask them, what do you mean by that, uh, some people include satire. Some people are talking about sensationalist headlines that are paired with factually accurate stories. Uh, when, we th when we think about this at Facebook, we are mostly thinking about false news, like disinformation that is the person who's spreading it knows it's false, and they are doing this to manipulate somebody. Uh, there are a variety of things we're doing to stop the spread of disinformation. And one of the things, well, I guess I'll, I'll just list them, and then we can, we can talk through them. But uh, one is stopping targeted or preventing targeted data collection. And this is, we saw some of this during the two, uh, 2016 presidential election, although not on Facebook trying to get access to people's private information so that you can actually use that in creating what ultimately ends up being disinformation campaigns. Um, so trying to prevent that from happening on our networks. Trying to stop what, what uh, we're calling false amplifier accounts. You know, if I create a false news story, and it, no matter how pretty it is, if I create a new Facebook account and I put it on there and I don't have any friends, it really doesn't, it's not going to have much of an effect. What makes it have an effect is if I have a network of accounts that are sharing that story and it starts to look like this story is coming from somewhere. And so in order to do that, you need to have a network of ultimately fake accounts that are purporting to be pe legitimate people. So we're looking to find those accounts and remove them. Um, that's something we've done for a long time, but I, I think we've invested a lot in that area recently. And actually, our chief security officer, Alex Stamos, wrote a paper on this that he released in, I think, April. It's called Information Operations. And if you Google it, you'll find it. But he walks through sort of what, what we've done to investigate that. Uh, we're also looking at disrupting financial incentives. A lot of people who are sharing false news, it's, it's to get people to click on it to take them offline for a profit. So by making it harder for them to create those sites, making it more expensive, that just decreases the, the amount of this activity we see. Then there's the other side, which is promoting uh, digital literacy among people who are reading news on Facebook. That's a, a, a longer term proposition, but something that we're doing through um, the News Literacy Project, through public service announcements that have reached millions of people. Uh, and then we're also trying to work with responsible journalism organizations to make sure that our products are actually helpful for their business and not hurtful. And that includes, we've got the Facebook Journalism Project, which we launched in January. And we put out an update, I think a week ago, in our newsroom that talks through some of the results we're seeing. But this is basically our effort to partner 
with organizations like the Knight Foundation, the Detroit uh, Journalism Cooperative, organizations around the world, local and national level, to see are there tools we could be providing them that will make social media work for their business model? Um, is there training we could provide them on how to more effectively use social media in terms of engaging long-term subscribers? Right. These are ongoing efforts, but that's, that's some of the work we're doing. Walter, you're, um, you're, you're well-versed in sort of this social media and tech world. What efforts do you think that they could do beyond what they're doing, if any, uh, to, to try to counter this? And is there a role for uh, the government to play or other civil society? Well, there's a role for a government to play uh, only in the sense that mm -hmm. I think President Trump and some of his people have purposely blurred the concept of what fake news is. So they'll throw it at you know NBC and whatever when it's they're, what they're objecting to is what they perceive, perhaps correctly, as biases one way or the other in news. Mm -hmm. You've always had that. You've always had that since you know colonial times. Newspapers and outlets have some, you know, they come in from a certain position. What I loved about what Monica said is that we should try to make as clear of a line as we can between that, which is, you know, you think so-and-so is a biased journalist, versus people who are intentionally, for profit or propaganda purposes, uh, putting news that they know to be false up, and they're spreading it, as we saw in the Middle East recently, and as the Russians have done with a whole set of trolls in which they have, you know, I've had it described to me, you know, just outlets in, you know, St. Petersburg with almost, you know, a lot of people working there, Perfect. where they're given false information to spread and ways to create accounts to amplify the spread of that false information. Now, obviously, every line, whether it's, you know, the lips of the Mona Lisa or the line between fake news and bias news, is slightly blurry. But let's not kid ourselves. We know what we're talking about when we say something has been purposely put up there that's false for a propaganda purpose and is being spread often by, you know, mm -hmm. fake accounts that are there to spread it. And I do wish we wouldn't delegitimize, whether it's Fox or NBC or CNN or any of it, with people who make mistakes as journalists, people who may be biased as journalists. We can call that out, but let's not confuse that with the real problem we're now having on the internet. Right. All right, um, because we only have a few minutes, I'd like to open it up to the audience. That and uh, we have people with microphones. It's, I think, you in the back there. Mika. Please identify yourself and then uh, state your. Hi, Mika Oyang, uh, Third Way, and former staffer on the House Intelligence Committee. Um, one of the things that's necessary in, in helping us b draw the balance between security and liberty is that there are whistleblowers who help us know if there's government overreach. And our country has had a long tradition of people coming forward um, and bringing their concerns forward to Congress, which is where all the whistleblower protections run. But in the past, people who brought their concerns forward to Congress, like Thomas Drake um, from the NSA, were aggressively prosecuted. And as a result of that, we've seen a number of damaging leaks of classified information coming out to the press. I'm wondering, do you think that the whistleblower system that we currently have in this country is broken? And how would you put it back on track? How do we deal with people who have a sincere concern that what their government is doing is wrong? Where should they take those concerns if the executive branch is doing things that they're not comfortable with? Dana. Well, at least at Justice, and I think every place else, uh, the NSA or the CIA, FBI, uh, they have a procedure in place uh, for people to uh, report, you know, things that have gone wrong. Uh, I think uh, that it works well. Uh, I'm not sure that it doesn't. I think, you know, the, I guess this is a natural tendency we're always going to have between uh, prosecutors and the press. Uh, you call them whistleblowers, where it becomes, if it's classified information, and I would call them a criminal. Uh, it violates, you know, their oath of office. It's against the law. I beg your pardon? Whistleblowers take it 
through the proper channel. Whistleblowers take their concerns to Congress. Sure. Leakers take their concerns yeah. to the press. There is a distinction there. Yeah. Oh, there, there without question is a, a distinction there. If they've taken it, you know, through the appropriate, uh, the appropriate to the appropriate forum, uh, I guess that's fine. Uh, well, and it's not. I guess it's fine. It is fine. Uh, so that's not, you know, the concern. But but what we've seen in the last four months is hardly uh, people being whistleblowers. Yes, in the back. Is that Mike? Hey there, Ryan Lizza with oh, The Ryan. New Yorker. I have a question for uh, Dana. Um, as you may have seen, there's been quite a bit of speculation in the press <laughs> about uh, whether President Trump may try and dismiss the special counsel, Robert Mueller. Um, so I have two questions on this. One, there's a bit of confusion about the order of succession in the Department of Justice and how in order like this, um, if Rod Rosenstein uh, declined to do this, where it would go to next. So could you clarify, clarify for us that order? I assume you're in that list somewhere. And then secondly, most I'm on so many lists, it's just <laughs> incredible. <laughs> and then secondly, and most importantly, how would you personally respond to a request from President Trump if it came to you to dismiss uh, Mueller? Thank you. Well, I'll answer one question, the obvious one, and I will not answer the other obvious one. Uh, I think the order of succession right now is obviously the Attorney General, who's recused, Rod Rosenstein, and uh, then uh, the associate, uh, and then I, I fall behind that. So uh, I'd have to go from Rod to Rachel Brand to me. Uh, I'm not going to speculate on uh, what, you know, would happen if I was going to make some particular decision in the future. You'd then uh, be another act, an acting attorney general a second time? But in what, I, I, six, guess, I guess for, for, for those, for those purposes, we're, we're, the, we're hoping that uh, we'll get some people confirmed uh, in the very near future, and mm -hmm. I'll be farther down on the ladder. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Do we have time for one more? We're out. Maybe. One more. Is anyone, did anyone have a question? Are we good? I think leaving you in the chain of command, okay, okay. was a great way to end. All right. <laughs> Thank you very, very much, Thank everyone. You. Let's give a round of applause here. Thank you. Very, I was like fascinated. <laughs> <laughs>